Good evening. The Jewish high holidays have just ended. And one of my dearest friends in Chicago, Abe Trieger, sent me a little poem that he found on the margin of his prayer book because he said it reminded him of me. It's a poem by Rose Osterland. My room has many doors. Each opens into another room with many doors. Without a word, I walk from door to door, from room to room. I hear my silence, hear strange voices, an echo of words behind doors that are shut. Where is the key? The key word. We all know what the key word is, prevention. The consensus today is that prevention is preferable to treatment. Yet, actions to make this happen are obscenely lagging behind. In the meantime, previous lives are lost, resources wasted. As oncologists, we are charged with providing from diagnosis to death, care to our cancer patients that enhances their quality of life, reduces pain and suffering, are we accomplishing that? And if not, then why not? And what can be done to improve the outlook for future patients? Are we truly appreciating the deep tragedy of cancer at an intimate individual level, the profound devastation of families, cancer's social and financial impact, its searing psychological traumas? Above all, are we doing the best we can with available options? Or should we be questioning some of the draconian measures we are practicing? How good are the solutions we offer if we constantly have to ask ourselves whether cancer or the treatment we prescribe will kill the patient? Which of the two is worse? Using chemotherapy, immune therapy, and stem cell transplant to cure cancer, as someone's aptly observed, is like beating the dog with a baseball bat to get rid of its fleas. Why is this the only choice we offer? Hopes of finding better drugs using the existing discovery platforms or using even more artificial systems of genetically engineered animals are as realistic as dissecting the brain and expecting to find and discover consciousness. After 50 years of developing cancer drugs this way, it's time to reassess the preclinical model? No. It's time to abandon this strategy altogether. Jeremiah's alone are pointless unless a new strategy accompanies the lamentation. The new strategy is to stop chasing after the last cell and focus on eliminating the first. Better still, prevent the appearance of the first cell by finding its earliest footprints. To begin the ending, we must end the beginning. Prevention will be the only compassionate, universally applicable cure. It's not prevention through lifestyle, lifestyle changes. Individuals with pristine eating and exercising habits get cancer because cancer-causing mutations accumulate as natural consequences of reproduction and aging of cells. The new strategy must go beyond early detection as practiced currently through mammograms and other routine streaming tests. The prevention I'm talking about is through identification and eradication of transformed cancerous cells at their inception before they've had a chance to organize into a bona fide malignant incurable disease. This may seem as an unattainable utopian dream, but it's achievable in a reasonable time. 
we are already using sophisticated technology to detect the residues of disease that linger after treatment, the last cancer cell. Can we not reverse the order of things and use the tests to detect the first? This was the first passage I wanted to read. Thank you. I thought this would lay the groundwork for what's coming in the next uh, hour or so. So there's practically no one in this room today whose lives have not been touched by cancer in one way or another. There are many cancer patients in the room today. I want you to know that this book is not a doom and gloom book at all. In fact, it is a very optimistic, forward-looking book in which we are anticipating that things will not be as they have been, but rather we really have an exciting new path to tread. I think a lot of people ask me, Dr. Raza, you're making all these uh, suggestions, but how is an entire field going to be able to change and switch? I think capitalism here helps because it has its good points in competition. As long as we can fix a goal and financially incentivize it, everybody will want to do it. Think about the fact that everybody is trying to develop more and more toxic therapies where 95% of the clinical trials they fund are going to fail. They know it, but they're still investing billions of dollars. So if we show a different way and set a new goal, I think that that would be a far more optimistic goal than a 95% chance of failure. And then of course, once you set the goal and the object of desire, nazare ko to jum bishe mishgaan bhi baar hai. Nargis ki aank se tujhe dekha kare koi. One should focus the eyesight on the object of desire. And when that happens, even the blinking of an eyelash is annoying. Wish we could look at the beloved with the eyes of the narcissist, the flower, which, of course, doesn't blink. The great French essayist Montaigne said something very beautiful in one of his essays, which I'd like to quote. I, who boast of embracing the pleasures of life so eagerly and so deliberately, find in them, when I examine them so minutely, little more than wind. But what of that? We are all wind. And the wind itself, wiser than we, takes its pleasure in veering and blustering around, content with its function. It does not seek stability and solidity, qualities that don't belong to it. In other words, it's exactly what Shakespeare also said. To thine own self be true. And then it follows as the night, the day, thou canst be false to any man. I had to be sincere to myself and simply write down what I experience on a daily basis. And as Rachel read that passage saying, suffering is what I see on a daily basis. So I decided that the field has become too far removed from patients. We need to bring the patient back front and center and look at everything from the prison of human anguish. What is the agony that our patients are going through when we glibly talk about, oh, this drug has a 30% chance of response? First of all, that means you're giving a drug to someone with 70, where 70% 70 people will not have any chance of response. And then the response will last not a great length of time. It's most of them are not curative. 
Now I am talking about advanced cancer. 68% of cancers that are diagnosed today are cured. And there has been a decline in mortality by 26%. That's a very good message. <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> I think Sid planted that message. <laughs> There's been a, a 26 percent fall in mortality from that cancer. That was the FDA. <laughs> but most of it is because of early detection and people stopping to smoke. So in other words, I do really believe that Everyone is anxious to help the patients, but we really are losing the path by trying to understand every signaling pathway. So because my whole life is spent as an oncologist seeing 30 to 40 patients every week for the last 35 years, I'd like to read a passage from chapter five, which is dedicated to JC, who's a patient who I saw when I was 34 years old, and she changed my way of thinking dramatically. So I'll just end with this passage. I remember a day earlier in her disease when JC was in an uncharacteristically somber and reflective mood. She sighed and confessed that she regretted not having valued her family more when she was well. She especially mentioned the pointless, inane arguments with her live-in mother-in-law over trivial issues leading to days of unpleasantness. Facing a lethal illness at the age of 34, JC wished for a second chance so she could show everyone the better angels of her nature. Confinement by disease allowed her to free her spirit, made her more generous. After being in remission for a year, one day she was in clinic for a visit and mischievously confessed that in the middle of a recent jaw-jaw with her mother-in-law, she suddenly stopped in her tracks and realized how normal she must be feeling. She had reverted to her whining, entitled, temperamental, vacuous, pre-diseased self. And those are some of my good points, she groaned, Dr. Raza. I tried to emerge a pearl out of the oyster of my illness. Instead, I've ended up impersonating the old crab. <laughs> Warning, Dr. Raza, when you find me being nice, suspect relapse. Maybe it was because those were my salad days. Maybe it was JC's ravishing personality, her youthful, stunning good looks, her vulnerability as a new mother, her wicked sense of humor, her poise, her willingness to befriend and school a fresh, insecure junior attending in ways of knowing cancer, ways of knowing life. Aristotle defined tragedy as a moment of discovery. The discovery has to be somehow purged. When Oedipus found that he had killed his father and married his mother, <clears throat> he had to blind himself, wandering off as some kind of a prophet. The years with JC shattered me in ways I was not aware of until I tried to put myself back together. The destruction and reconstruction process, painful stepwise rehabilitation of my soul, marked by many false starts and regressions, was my equivalent of blinding and unblinding myself. I stopped being the newly minted warrior oncologist. I emerged as someone who was no longer startled by cancer's infinitely unpredictable testy toes, its gruesome cruelties, Rather, I became an adult who had learned to stop twinning the suffering of individual patients. The mystery of the world is the visible, as Oscar Wilde pointed out, not the invisible. JC helped me make that leap from dallying in the abyss of cancer's ruthless nihilism to considerations of more humanistic humanitarian issues of life and death. JC gave no lectures, she wrote no books. It was her sober acceptance of the unspeakable tragedy in a thousand little gestures that slowly but surely parted the curtains, allowing me to witness grace in all its heroic splendor. She gave my eyesight the insight it needed. JC made the invisible visible. 
she opened entire new mysterious worlds for me to wander in as I negotiated each new patient who came with their own unique set of cryptic and mysterious challenges. The best tribute I could pay her when she died was to pledge my life to study and cure the disease that took hers. If I have 72 more lives, I would pledge myself 72 more times to JC. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can we be heard in the back? And Azra, would you want to test your mic? Just make sure you can be heard in the back. Can you hear me? In the back, yes. Um, I thought I would also begin with one of the one of the most beautiful uh, quotes, uh, poems in your book. Um, this is from Emily Dickinson, uh, who writes, I felt a cleavage in my mind as if my brain had split. I try, tried to match it seam by seam, but could not make them fit. The thought behind I strove to join unto the thought before, but sequence raveled out of reach like balls upon a floor. Um, I, um, maybe we, we'd begin by asking you uh, when your brain began to split um, and when you felt that, that cleavage in your mind. What, tell me the moment of, of not the, f- the first cell, but the moment of the first book, the moment of the first page on this book. How, how did that happen? What, what drove you to write a book? You have a full-time career as an oncologist, as a researcher, um, what, what drove you, what was, that, what was that moment like? It's very strange, Sid, because I never considered myself as a writer. I still don't. I'm an oncologist and a scientist, and it's the last thing that would ever occur to me to write. Um, but I think what forced me to tell the story is Shahrzad, my daughter's best friend, Andrew. Andrew was 22 years old and is diagnosed with an aggressive kind of brain cancer. 16 months later, he is handed a form to sign, a DNR, do not resuscitate form. And he didn't sign it, he sent it back. How do you sign a DNR form at 23? But that evening, when his father came to spend the night with him, he called them back and signed the form, saying simply, I couldn't do it in the presence of my mother and sister. They are in this room today. And what happened that forced me to finally tell this to the world is the first thing he said after his surgery when he he was told that he has cancer was he told his mother don't worry mom just call Asra she is on the cutting edge of cancer she's going to find some cure for me don't worry and I have felt so ashamed since that day How are we failing the Andrews and Umars and JCs of this world? So I think it was a very emotional and deeply painful experience that really forced me to start telling the stories. And while telling the stories, ask the questions of why are we here? What are we doing with this? What... um the book is full of stories. We'll come back to the stories in a second. Um, walk us through what, what you imagine might happen in the future to someone who has brain cancer. Um, uh, but let, let's pause that thought for a second. Let's, let's walk the, the audience a little bit through the landscape of, of cancer diagnosis and treatment. 
walk us in the United States for the last 10 odd years as to what has happened epidemiologically? What is, give us a landscape view of what's happened. Where have there been successes and what the failings have been? That's a, a question that should be close to everybody's heart because cancer is something that uh, one in three men and uh, uh, one in two men and one in three women are likely to get. So the incidence of cancer increases with age. Our population is aging and that's a good thing, but that's putting everybody at high risk of cancer. Just stop for a second, Azra. How many people in this audience know? So, so let's say that statistic is true, right? So one in two, one in three. This is basically, in other words, something that is bound to affect your life. How many people in this audience are totally familiar um, with the landscape of cancer? This is one disease. In other words, how many people know what's happened in the last 20 odd years to the changing or altering epidemiology of cancer? It's about one in every five, one in every 10. Is that, that sounds, that, that sounds like this approximately. So tell us, so what has happened? So disease of aging, increasing it's in- disease of aging. Um, and the problem, second problem is that despite billions of dollars spent in research and millions of papers, we are still using the same strategies to treat cancer. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgery. Except for rare exceptions, which are working in small, <clears throat> rare types of cancers, this is the backbone of cancer treatment today. 68% of cancers are cured today. 68% are cured, but how? With slash poison and burn. And so it's not a painless procedure. My question is why after 50 years are we still using these draconian things, first of all? Even though we are care curing 68% people, we don't need to pat ourselves on the back and give each other gold medals for it. And the second problem is the 30 plus percent who are diagnosed when the disease is advanced, their chances of survival are pretty much the same as they were 50 years ago. That's the landscape. Um, and then so now take Andrew's case and um, or JC's case. How would you like to see that landscape differ? Walk, walk us through the to what, might, what, what might happen scientifically and we'll talk about what might happen at, on a human level but what might happen scientifically? How would you like to see that change? And then let's talk about some of the challenges that those changes will, will, will bring with them. Sometimes the most visible things are the most invisible to us. And one of the things that Andrew's case really drove home to me is that no age is immune from cancer. Uh -huh. And the second thing is that it is a painless killer. The disease can be so advanced in your body and you have no idea what's going on. We think we know our bodies. No, we don't at all. And so the idea is that why are we waiting for it to, uh, to have reached the stage where it was inoperable, unresectable? So what, would, what should Andrew have done? And what should people do if they are in, in end? What, what, sh what should have been done? What could have been done? I think what we need to do now is to start thinking about how to change this, uh, the whole landscape from anybody being detected late to everybody being detected early. How do we do that? So far, we have brought down cancer mortality just by very gross screening measures like mammography pap smears, uh, PSA, colonoscopy, that's made a big difference. You diagnose cancers early and you treat them early. But those are very gross measures done annually. I'm saying we should be treating the human body like a machine and constantly monitoring it for the appearance of any kind of disease. disease. In fact, the way I see the future healthcare going is all towards prevention and proactive measures rather than treatment. So, so should, should, uh, should Andrew have had scans while he was asymptomatic? What do you mean by these proactive yes. measures? I think so what we need to do is use the latest technology, whether it's scanning and imaging or devices or 
uh, development of uh, biomarkers from blood and saliva and sweat and tears and breath and urine and stool from everything we should be able to monitor. So the way I imagine the future to be would be that we need to go now and use serious rigorous scientific methods to develop the technologies that will be unravel the earliest footprints of cancer. So let's say that we start uh, monitoring uh, blood and saliva and urine uh, at regular intervals right now from healthy individuals for the next 10 years. Well, some of them will develop multiple sclerosis. Somebody will develop cancer. Somebody. So what was that that happened 9, 10 years ago before that diagnosis? How can we develop these technologies? So what we are working on is trying to combine all these measures together eventually so that uh, ideally what would happen to a future Andrew is that when an inf a child is born even in infancy, we are able to implant a chip or an, a device under the skin which is constantly able to uh, test for the appearance of uh, abnormal, whether it's proteins or it's cell-free DNA or it's microRNA or it is a, a, a barcode for various proteins associated with brain cancer or bone marrow tumors or breast cancers. We should have the technology to do all this. And this is where we need to, uh, to imagine the future Andrews to be. Now, some of these technologies have been invented in the past. You mentioned breast ma mammogram. You mentioned the pap smear. You mentioned uh, the PSA test. And their record has been quite mixed. So uh, the mammography, for instance, uh, if you look at, the, look at mammography over the years, everyone beautifully does their mammogram. The impact on survival uh, by, from mammography alone has been extraordinarily minimal. Um, the PSA is much worse. Uh, in fact, the PSA actually increased mm -hmm. the incidence of prostate cancer and caused hundreds of thousands of uh, biopsies. The best example of this is um, uh, there's a famous story uh, of uh, uh, doctors in South Korea who were sold ultrasound devices. Um, and they began to use the ultrasound devices to monitor for thyroid cancer. Mm. The incidence of thyroid cancer went up 1,000% uh, in, in yeah, South Korea. Yeah. The number of deaths uh, from, from thyroid cancer went, went up by what percentage? Zero. Zero. So in other words, they were finding lots and lots of cancers which were not likely to kill you. Um, the opposite end of the spectrum, of course, are pap smears, which, are, which absolutely save lives. Um, and other detection technologies. So what level of confidence should we have that we will not go down the same road again and, and do two things? One of them is cause patients the toxicity of overdiagnosis. So imagine a young Andrew and suddenly a, your, 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 your chip finds something and then you know, an incidental uh, shadow is found on his in his brain and you know one thing leads to another biopsy etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's a toxicity to the patient and secondly how do we prevent a, the financial toxicity that will come to, to the healthcare system in general if everyone was if everyone in this room had a device or a scan uh, we would bust the the, the bank mm -hmm. how, how how can we be confident that the new era will bring um, these changes what, what produces this confidence yeah in us Sid, I have to uh, confess that for a while when I was growing up in my family, the definition of a bum was anyone over 18 not going to medical school. <laughs> so I have lots of siblings who are doctors. Um, and my younger sister is uh, at the Brigham, the radiologist. Ma'am, her, her book is the acknowledged test book on mammography, uh, Sugra Raza. And she and I have this conversation very often about right. mammography and its place. And she literally has a fit whenever I say overdiagnosis, overtreatment, because she says, okay, just putting in a needle to do a fine needle aspirate, if I find something abnormal, that is supposed to be much more hurtful than finding a cancer that's spread all over, for God's sake. 
She doesn't accept this at all. Secondly, I have to also agree with you that these techniques for screening have been milked to their maximum benefit. That's it. We are not going to get anywhere more with them. But that, those are not the gross techniques I'm talking about. Why in this day and age with such sophisticated technology available that there are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, everything on iCloud, everything that we do these days is just done by super sophisticated technology. Why not use all of those to now use them in, uh, in uh, developing the tests that we need for early detection. And let's say that my chip that I have implanted in somebody detects an abnormal cell. Why should we rely on a single test to be the ultimate answer for trouble? That should then be supplemented by 20 other tests. Is there, if there is an abnormal cell, is the cell indicating a potentially lethal illness or not? And if yes, then what is the aggressiveness of that disease? All those things we should be able to distinguish between. Then you talk about the financial burden. Many people ask me, Dr. Raza, isn't it true that now the pharma companies are going to be very upset with you because I am saying that a lot of the drugs that they are developing are not helping patients. In fact, they are hurting a lot more patients than they help. But absolutely not. I don't agree with that because in fact, in reality, right now, the pharma companies only have to deal with individuals who have cancer. And there's 1.7 million new cancer patients that are diagnosed every year. But if we start monitoring every healthy individual, there will be the whole country at their disposal. And then think about it that sequencing the human genome first time around took 15 years and a billion dollars. And today, we do it in a week for how much? $1,000. $1,000. This is the beauty of capitalism at some level, that within 20 years, the sequencing that cost a billion dollars costs $1,000 today. Everybody gets vaccinated. Are we going to be concerned about the economic crisis that's going to come? But anyway, what about the average cancer drug today that's helping 20 to 30 percent patients for five months, median, costs $100,000 a year? Aren't we wasting all these resources? Aren't we hurting patients right now? We are worried about, oh, we might detect somebody early and overdiagnose, overtreat. No, we shouldn't be doing that either. We should protect every individual. Today, when a drug works in 30% patients, this is called a game changer. Things are proclaimed from the rooftops. But has some, and, and when I criticized this in a, one of our meetings at Columbia University, somebody said to me, well, Azra, you may think so, but my patient lived for eight months, and those eight months really mattered because the patient was able to go and visit uh, and attend his grandson's graduation. And I couldn't agree more with this, that of course it matters. Even eight months matter, even two months of improvement in survival matter. But first of all, did anyone think about the 80% patients who had to take the same drug and did not respond at all but suffered all the toxicities? And 42% people in this country today, if they are diagnosed with cancer, 42% will become completely financially ruined at two plus years. I have patients, Sid, who will travel from New Jersey by train and subway with a hemoglobin of five and six grams because they cannot afford to take a cab because all their money is, where is it going? Who is benefiting from this? And we can't just keep blaming pharmaceutical companies. 
all of us are to be blamed. The wastage is terrible. So why are, why aren't people looking at what's happening now? The country is going bankrupt. It is an unsustainable healthcare system right now, especially in oncology. We should be really looking at this. And if nothing comes out of my book, although the solution is right in the title, the first cell, but you can ignore even the title. If nothing else comes out, at least understand what the problem is. Because right now, the issue isn't that we don't have a solution for cancer. The issue for me is that we are not even appreciating the problem in all its entirety. So at least we should be able to come to terms, take off the blinders, and see what we are doing. What's, what, is your, what has been your sense of the attempts thus far to find the first, these first cells? So now there are, you know, as the, as the, as the field has moved forward, there are companies, there are uh, efforts. The NIH is leading an effort. Um, the companies like Grail uh, that are leading efforts to find uh, the mutations in circulating DNA, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but most of those studies, maybe the first generation studies, have not come out to be resounding successes. Is that because of a systematic problem in the way the studies are done? Are we, wait, are we doing something wrong there? In other words, let's say that, that one signed you up um, to, to now direct the, the first cell center, um, which you, of course, have initiated. But what, how, how would you change course even among the believers? I think we have to do the science. There's just no getting away from it. And science costs money. I started my career in 1977 when I came to this country, but did my residency and fellowship. And then in the 80s, I started a serious uh, study and treatment of oncology patients. And I started by treating acute myeloid leukemia. But within seven years, it was clear to me that in my lifetime, this disease will not be cured. It is so vicious and aggressive. So the only thing I knew was, OK, let's try to diagnose it early and stop uh, intercept before it reaches this end stage monstrosity. And so I started paying attention to pre leukemia and following these patients along the natural history of their diseases as they progress towards acute leukemia. Pre leukemias are called myelodysplastic syndromes, and a third of these patients can develop into acute leukemia. As soon as I decided to do that, um, here is where uh, being an immigrant really helped me. Because had I gone to school in this country, the next step would be to make an animal model to study the disease. But I was a naive Pakistani young person who didn't know any better. And I said, if I'm going to study this disease, I need cells. So I just started saving bone marrow and blood cells on my patients and putting them into a bank. And today, that tissue bank has over 60,000 samples from thousands of patients studied longitudinally. Many patients are sitting in this room today, which is so humbling for me, who have given me cells 10 years ago and now continue to give those uh, their samples that are banked. So the idea is now that technology has evolved, now that we have all the tissue samples, why not go ahead and apply the technology to see what caused this progression, working our way backwards to pre-leukemia, and then who are the patients who are susceptible to get even MDS or pre-leukemia? Why did they get it? Was there a particular genetic makeup, germline DNA polymorphism that they were born with? Was What made them at risk of this disease? And once we identify, let's say, 5,000 patients in the tissue bank have an extra chromosome 8 abnormality. And those who had extra chromosome 8, many of them tended to have a particular kind of DNA they were born with. Well, once we identify that, now we can go to the kind of uh, public domains where sequences of normal individuals are present and see how many have that abnormality. And that's why how you move to now from pre-leukemia to start screening healthy individuals. So I think for me, the road is very clear cut. We need to study samples of human tissue 
not try to create an abnormal disease in animals and try to study that. We have to study human samples. Using the latest technology, we cannot cut corners. There will be many a uh, slip betwixt cup and lip. But hey, we have to keep going. This is why I'm so excited. Young people are in the room today. They have to keep carrying on and doing this rigorous science. And uh, I think the, the, the kind of technology, the grail and uh, other things that you mentioned, they're in their infancy. Of course, it will take some time for us to develop. But what we have to do is stop wasting all the resources on things that are not helping people, especially our patients. That's why in the book, I make a big distinction between disease and illness. Disease is something that doctors diagnose and they treat. Illness is something that patients are going through. We have become almost blind to the illness part. We are so focused on trying to find a cure for the disease, even for 20% patients, that we really have ended up distancing ourselves from our very first um, rule that we are taught as doctors, first do no harm. We are harming our cancer patients. And I think that enough is enough. Going forward, we have to change. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an in, in, incredible, uh, it, it is an incredible profession that uh, holds as, as its primary motto uh, something in the negative. Uh, don't do something. Um, most professions encourage you to do things. Um, ours encourages us not to do something, yes. and that's because, not, not, this is, and it's not a joke, it's because of the magnitude. There is no other profession that carries the magnitude of the burden uh, of, um, no one has, given, has been given the invasiveness um, and, and the power yes. that, uh, that medicine has been given. No other profession has been given that, that special uh, that special power and to some extent. And what a beautiful book you have written about the history of all this. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I'm Sid's greatest admirer and in my opinion, there's no better science writer ever oh, than Sid Mukherjee. I say this to him all the time, but I, because I, I think that the way Sid has really put together the whole story in an, The Emperor of All Maladies <coughs> was also an eye-opening thing for me because just reading everything in one place, it was an amazing uh, tour de force that you came up Thank with. You very much. So I agree completely that, uh, that I think the whole, uh, the whole field has been do's and don'ts, but yet we are not getting anywhere. So I'm not saying I have all the answers. First of all, I'm defining the problem better, at least uh, based on my patient's anguish and uh, not just Andrew and Umar, who uh, I adore. Who the book, by the way, yeah. Yes, who, yes. So I think that, uh, uh, that I think all of these examples of patients tell us that at least it's time to accept the way things are being done as if there's an inherent righteousness in them. Right. I mean, there's something very, very moving, of course, right from the beginning, because, um, I mean, the, the subtitle of the book was very moving to me. It says that the human cost of pursuing cancer to the last. Um, you know, you, you might come to this book thinking that this book is about dying, well, by the end of the book, you realize this book is about living. Um, and this Thank book is you. about, uh, about um, it is not about, uh, it's not only about compassion around dying. It is being compassionate uh, uh, among those who, who live, right? The, um, and so one of the most interesting things uh, in, in this book um, is that there are so many visible patients that you begin to then think about the invisible patients, uh, or rather what you might call the invisible pre-patients, the people who haven't yet developed. Uh, and, and that's one of the, to me, that was one of the very uh, kind of the deep mysteries of this book and one of the great, uh, really, I should say, powers of, 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 of reading the book is that there was story upon story upon story of people who succumbed and therefore, there, it becomes a, a, a cri de corps. It becomes a cry from the heart about trying to not make everyone into those stories. How do we prevent this 
from happening? How do we not, not have them? Um, before we open up to, to, to the audience, um, t- tell us, um, m- most people have heard this, tell us about your own transformation as you, as you watched Harvey through his, through his illness. I mean, this is a very personal uh, journey for you. This is not someone else's. You're not just writing as an oncologist. You're writing as a wife and as a mother. Tell us that story, um, and then we'll open up to the audience. Mm-hmm. And tell us what, what it taught you. How, how could we, what, what, what should we have done differently? Uh, Shahrazad, my daughter, was only four years old when Harvey was diagnosed and uh, eight when he died. And a uh, few weeks after he died, she developed uh, the flu or something, and she has suffers from severe asthma, so she was, uh, that got aggravated. She was very sick, high fevers. Uh, but four or five days later, she started to improve, and yet uh, one morning I'm sitting in the living room and working, and suddenly uh, eight-year-old Shahrzad came out crying hysterically, unconsolable. I was convinced that she has had a relapse. She's worse, but it was impossible for her to stop crying. Finally, when she got a hold of herself, all she could say was, Mom, actually I'm feeling fine now. But now I know how terrible it feels to be sick and how good it feels to get better. But my dad never got better. That really struck me that an eight-year-old is able to empathize so deeply with her father. Although he took every care possible not to let on, a whole contingent of people are here from Chicago. Right. Lakshmi, Veela, Naomi, Shibin. They all saw me going through this. They were there the whole time. And we were in this together in a way. When you are actually in the situation, cancer is such a dizzying, disorienting thing. Because as Harvey himself pointed out, no sooner do you get used to one situation, the things change. And then you have to reorient yourself all over again. Harvey's son Mark is here. Shahrzad is here, of course. And his daughters, Sarah and Vanessa, couldn't come, but they were there the entire time. And yet, nobody could appreciate how much pain Harvey went through. Right. And I couldn't appreciate how much pain other cancer patients go through until I shared a bed with a cancer patient and saw the suffering. Did it change me as an oncologist? I don't think so, Sid, because I always have taken care of my patients the same way. But it certainly changed my eyes forever. Everything around me was the same, but my eyes changed and my perceptions changed entirely. Well, thank you for um, setting setting the entire uh, world straight. Um, And thank you for identifying the problem and thank you for for, for showing us um, where the where the gaping holes are, there's a there's an emperor's new clothes quality about this book, um, um, and so um, another title could have been the emperor of all maladies without any clothes. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but um, but uh, what what kind of response have you? Maybe the last question. What kind of response have you gotten from the from the cancer community? How how has it reacted? It's a very provocative book. Uh, what is the, what is the reaction been? What what are people, your your oncologist colleagues, your friends, your the, the folks you know at the national institutes? Uh, what's the what's the reaction been? I think very positive. Reaction is uh, because it seems like everyone's ready to hear this. Right. So 
there will be some disgruntled people, I'm sure, but uh, I haven't heard from them. <laughs> Nor will you. Um, we, <laughs> we have time for, for questions uh, from the audience. Please ask. But uh, can I just say... Yes, of course, you're going to say a, a yeah. few words of uh, thanks. I asked uh, for a moment to just uh, thank a few people before we proceed with opening this to the audience. So I want to begin by thanking Rachel, who has been a dear friend for all these years. I've been in New York and Asia Society for organizing this amazing program. And of course, many thanks to Sid, the most multidimensional individuals I have met. All I can say is that speaking about, uh, speaking about uh, a book on cancer in his presence felt like bragging about a flood in the presence of Noah. <laughs> um, thanks to all my patients, many of you are here tonight, as are families of many of those who are not with us. Special thank you to my dearest friend, Nahid Asfar, mother of Umar, in chapter one. Despite every effort to travel from Karachi and be here tonight, Nahid had to cancel her trip at the last minute. A very special thanks to Elena Andrew's mother and to Kat Slutsky, his sister, who along with Shehrzad co-authored the Andrew story. Thanks to the leadership of Columbia University and the administrative staff, the nurses, researchers, oncologists, they are simply the best people to work with. Many of you are here, thank you. A special thanks to Dr. Abdullah Ali, the current director of the MDS Translational Research Lab, and to Dr. Naomi Galili, the previous director. These are two of the most brilliant scientists and best friends that I could ask for. And a big thanks to Mr. Muhammad Mumtaz, who has been meticulously maintaining and guarding the tissue repository with his life for two decades. Thank you, Mumtaz ji. Thanks to all the folks at Basic Books, Lara, TJ, Liz, Kelsey, Nancy, Rachel, Melissa, thank you so much. Of course, thanks to my siblings, my sister-in-law, Nasli, my nieces and nephews, who've all been cheering me on throughout my life and now through the process of the book. I want to single out my younger brother, Abbas, to thank. Abbas Raza is the founder of the internationally acclaimed website, Three Quarks Daily. He has been my best editor since he turned 19, very tough. He published shorter and abbreviated versions of several chapters on Three Quarks Daily website, starting 18 years ago with Harvey's obituary. A deep gratitude is owned to Harvey's children, Sarah and Mark and Vanessa. I want to thank my daughter, Shehrzad. Besides the love, support, and encouragement she gives me, Sheher has done the audio version of the book as well. It's really great. I recommend it. When I arrived in America as a 24-year-old immigrant, I found a warm and welcoming home here. I understood the meaning for the first time of what Immanuel Kant has said, which is that hospitality means the right of a stranger not to be treated as a stranger. It is because of this spirit of hospitality in America that I can say to Shahrzad and to all the young people in this room, do not give in to darkness being forecast in your future. Instead, live up to the uniquely generous spirit of this country. Be aware that in this theater of life, it is reserved only for God and for angels to be lookers on. For the rest of us, it is essential to become alive and work very, very hard to carve out our own destinies. And no country will give you a better chance than the United States. So I thank the US for helping me educate myself. 
and to the audience, I would like to end by saying or quoting from Alfred Lord Tennyson. The long day wanes, the slow moon rises, the deep moons round with many voices. Come, my friends, it's not too late to seek a newer world. For my purpose still holds to sail beyond all the bands of stars in the western sky. It may be we shall touch the happy isles. It may be we shall see the great Achilles whom we knew. For though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that force which in olden days moved heaven and earth, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I'd like to make it as brief as I can. If I don't, please, I apologize. First of all, thank you very much, Dr. Raza, for a very thought-provoking and stimulating talk. And your book, while it talks about the first and the last self, the human touch is probably the most important in it. Dr. Mukherjee, you uh, mentioned this book is not about dying, but about living. Someone was extremely close to me who went through 12 hours of surgery when asked why were you so calm for cancer, said it was very easy to know that I may die. What's difficult is not knowing how long I'm going to live. As a pathologist, Dr. Reza, the landscape that you paint, we're there, we're doing hereditary cancer testing, and what you're saying does not only apply to cancer, but just apply to every inherited and acquired disease. The ethical question that I'd like to ask is, we will find the genetic mutation, whether inherited or environmental, by screening, and the industry, the capitalist industry, is finding that's where the money is lying. And slowly, those millions of dollars being put into it are becoming billions of dollars. But the ethical question is, what do we do with that? Do we then taking, start taking out imperfect cells, modifying them and start putting them into the body again? Or we just wait and follow, as you said, and monitor with a bar tag? and say that when the genotypic expression has converted into the phenotypic expression at the first point, treat it. What do you and how do you handle that? How would you handle it? How would you handle that? Why don't you take this question? No. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I just want to make sure he's read the book. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you do the major answering of the question, but of course, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of it is in, in you have, you, you, you make many, many points over and over again that a spectrum of uh, things could be done, a spectrum of actions could be taken, um, and that might include um, giving earlier therapy, uh, more directed therapy. It might include early detection and re the removal of the cell. It might in include modifications in the environment that prevent such cells from happening in the uh, first place. There might be immune modifications that, um, that are involved. Um, Dr. Ali and Dr. Raza and I are involved in a, probably one of the most exciting projects in my life, uh, very much along those lines, to change the cells using gene editing tools and putting them back in the body so that you can, make, you can then treat MDS and AML. It's probably the most exciting project, and Dr. Ali has led that project now for uh, four years. So, um, really, this, this, the, the, the whole spectrum um, has been, uh, you know, is, is available. What are your, yeah. your thoughts about it? I agree that this is the way we are going, and yeah. using more than one technology. That's correct. Maybe we have one time for one last question, and then we don't 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 want to uh, miss the chance to see this short uh, short clip of the film.
Hi, Dr. Raza. Um, I just started medical school, and you touched on this a little bit already, but I wanted to know, um, considering the very somewhat divided healthcare landscape that, landscape that my generation is inheriting, what would you suggest would be the way to get around to making the vision that you've put in this book a reality? Um, because, of course, there's the research to be done, but there's also like the public opinion that you have to sway and um, the hurdles that you have to face. So, yeah, what would be your advice? That's a wonderful question from a budding physician. I'm very realistic about what we can do. My life has been committed to early detection of leukemia since 1984. Fat lot of good I have done. I feel very depressed about it. I feel embarrassed having the same conversations with my patients. And especially in front of Andrew, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror for really. It was so embarrassing to me. So nothing is going to change overnight, but we have to keep trying. I have been giving grand rounds and tumor boards and dinner lectures and morning talks and speaking on podcasts and uh, NPR and on television and every possible uh, venue I could find. Um, people listen to me, they agree with me, then they go back home and keep doing the same thing. Uh, the most important thing is, however, awareness and education. And this book, The First Cell, is the latest weapon in my assault on getting people to, sh to be shaken into taking their blinders off and looking at reality. What can a young person do? I always say the same thing, Sid, which is educate yourselves and educate everyone around you. Your job is to become as fantastic a physician as possible. And it's not going to happen overnight because every patient is going to teach you something you didn't know. And you should be open to that experience, but you should continuously seek knowledge. And make sure that everybody around you is also involved in critically looking at the issues. Honestly, and with a will towards cooperation rather than competition. And as I said, if enough of us really start talking about it, this can happen. I'll give you one small example. Today, if I wanted to study just 200 patients at two time points from the tissue repository, at the stage of pre-leukemia and acute leukemia, two time points, but using all the current genomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, all these technologies, it would cost us four and a half million dollars. Dr. Ali is sitting here who shows me the bill, four and a half million dollars to study 200 patients samples. If I want to study several thousand, that's hundred million dollars. No one is going to give it to me. Well. The people who should be interested in finding the first cell most anxiously are those people who are at risk of de developing cancer. Do you know that the people who are at highest risk of developing cancer are people who have already had one cancer? One in five new cancers appear in people who already have had one cancer. In this country today, there are 20 million cancer survivors almost. Even if just 1 million of those cancer survivors give me $10 a month for a year, that's $100 million. That can have the entire tissue repository examined, explored, interrogated, and finding some of the answers that we are looking for. So. Until there is a single breath left in my body, I'm going to keep saying the same thing and fighting the good fight. And as a young person, what's my advice to you? You have to become the best doctor that you can and really take your patients seriously, not just the disease part, but the illness part.
take care of the whole patient and make sure that you are looking at everything, questioning everything seriously. I hope that answers this. Thanks.